Often they'll show up and be like, well, I'm a sub, but I can't do pain. And I know that that makes me not a sub. It's like, no, 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 no. Like you are a sub if you want to exchange power and that can look like anything you want. Hello, honey, and welcome to Honey Do Me Podcast. I'm Cass. And I'm Emma, and we're just two gals looking for a good lay. Aren't we all? (laughs) But when it comes to sex, we're just as lost as you and have no idea what we're doing. Luckily, we will stop at nothing to get the answers we need. Cue our expert guests. We're ready to overshare and ask all the embarrassing questions so you don't have to. By the end of every episode, you will be dripping in actionable steps and ready to take on the damn world. Or at least take it from behind. (laughs) (laughs) So tell us, honey. How how do do you do you? Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome <laughs> to another week with, with your, your two gals. Poop and toots. Poop and toots. <laughs> Here we are. We get in trouble for making fart jokes. But yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Cass has been over that one quite yet. I'll never be over it. I don't do well with criticism. I don't know if you can tell that about me. I don't think sensitive people were made to be criticized. We give everyone this warning in our outro, which you never listen to. I know. We say, do not, please, say anything mean to us. <laughs> we will crumble. And under cry. all of that stress <laughs> my counselor will hear about it mm-hmm. they're gonna know your name <laughs> they're gonna know your handle what you said mm-hmm. and that i was upset yeah and if you can live with that <laughs> then that's, that's all you the blood is on your hands mm-hmm. uncut jobs <laughs> i think that all <laughs> the uncut time I uncut jobs. <laughs> who doesn't at this point right honestly now in society honestly besides having uncut jobs how are you <laughs> fine how are you doing i'm doing okay Mm -hmm. i'm a little all over the place lots Mm. of personal stuff going on but i learned a fun fact this week okay do tell i don't know if fun's the right word but i'm gonna do it okay um it is sunbathing your perineum aka your (gasps) taint oh my gosh yeah so i think it's it's obviously a little woo woo i don't know if there's actual scientific evidence that what i'm about to say is true but Uh i saw a tiktok on it from a crunchy lady Mm -hmm. and she seemed to know what she was talking about but apparently if you can bathe your taint in the sun for like four to 30 seconds i think was what she said that's a sensitive area you don't want to burn it i guess so yeah um that would get itchy. If you- yeah, it can like bring in a lot of good energy. Like it's a, huh. a little energy source. And that's kind of like, <laughs> if you think about like your root that chakra. That like something someone made up <laughs> to get okay. you to see their perineum. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't offering to show it. They just asked me to send them mine. If you look my perineum in the eye for four to 30 seconds. You'll have good luck. Okay, well, she said it wasn't good luck. And it wasn't good vibes either. It was like feel-good stuff, like if endorphins or something. <laughs> Fucking A. All those goddamn TikToks. You'll have the best luck. Okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. It's called a study. I'm a researcher in the daytime. I don't know if you know uh-huh, that. Uh-huh. I'm a real live researcher. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start sunning my taint, and then I will report back back next week okay how what is the best position to be in downward facing I think it's dog exactly what you think i think it's like the the not sleeping baby what the child's pose <laughs> i think i don't think that's i think that's still facing down too and far and then put my ass up a little higher so downward facing. like doggy style or, or you could do happy baby Oh, yeah. So I guess it just depends on if I want which child my you entire be. vulva. Child pose or happy baby? <laughs> I don't know. I'll try them both. I will. I'll promise you this. I can't promise you much, but I can promise you that I will try different ways of sunning my perineum. Okay. Um, I'm coming into some new natural light <laughs> quite soon. <laughs> That's what she. Well, how can I make this dirty? Oh, I can't. I missed it. I'm moving. <laughs> Into a new apartment. That's what your <laughs> calls his penis. That's what I wanted oh. to say. That's his new natural mm-hmm. light. Uh, uh, so I'm just really excited. I'm in my current place. If I were to sun my perineum, the world would be. <laughs> You're on the um, bottom floor. Yeah. Right next to a walkway. <laughs> yeah. So picture downward facing <laughs> dog. Your butt would just be right over the, the hedges. Uh-huh. And then you'd just see your perineum. Yeah. Amongst other things. Amongst <laughs> others. All of my uncut jobs. But like... <laughs> 
if you're suntanning, are you Winnie the Pooh, like shirt on, <laughs> pants off? Are you <laughs> completely naked? <laughs> I'm wearing a sweater, obviously. <laughs> A beanie, some mittens, and a sweater, and, and a, socks, a nice of course. Scarf. <laughs> you yeah. should just just pull your pants down to your knees. <laughs> My basketball shorts. <laughs> oh, this visual is giving me luck. Yeah, on itself. <laughs> I already have good luck. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna try that out, and I will report back on okay. all of the good luck that I got. Okay. Um, <laughs> good luck. Just in it time for St. Patrick's more scientific, Day. Slightly. <laughs> I believe it, but not you can't like bring 100%. that to me. And not I know. Well, I don't think I can bring perineum sunbathing to anyone and expect <laughs> just like a, oh yeah, I've heard great studies on I've that. heard great things about <laughs> mm-hmm. perineum studies. Um, I don't want anybody else to do this and get their taint burnt on my dime. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> On your dime. <laughs> they fax yeah. you like yeah. an invoice <laughs> um, for so sunscreen. Do this with your... <laughs> best judgment with your <laughs> best taint in mind yeah um what else is the best thing to keep in mind for today our our great guest to be a good little girl to be a good little girl <laughs> today we have on lena dune of ask a sub to talk mm-hmm. all about subbing we've talked all about domin domin <laughs> damn domin damn domin dear old darman <laughs> i'm damn domin <laughs> From the West. <laughs> nice to meet you, howdy. <laughs> nice to meet you, howdy. <laughs> That's how real cowboys talk. It is. Nice to meet you, howdy. <laughs> have you seen my, my white knee-high cowboy boots? They have. Okay. Those are what real cow cow people wear. <laughs> <laughs> you made me snot. Oh, that was funny. Um, We're talking about being a sub-submissive that type of Mm -hmm. thing yeah we talk about letting go we talk about different role play scenarios we talk about praise kinks being a brat Mm -hmm. like all of the different things that are in the world of subbing from a true sub yeah being a brat is more than just like a little insult it's actually Mm -hmm. also a different type of subbing which we get Mm -hmm. into and it's I think it's fun (laughs) I think I I won't call myself a brat but maybe I'm a brat (laughs) maybe I am Anyway, I think it'll be super interesting because Lena Dune is a Mm -hmm. 24-hour, seven-day-a-week sub, which is a different perspective, um, a little bit more advanced, but it's really good. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. So keep going, bitch. (laughs) You better work, bitch. (laughs) Keep listening. (laughs) I'm a good dom. I'm a good dom. Okay, we'll see you on the other side. Yeah, we will. That's in order. Yeah. Hi, my name's Lena Dune, and I go by Ask a Sub on Instagram, where I make memes about the world of kink. I am a 24-7 submissive and a bisexual woman, and I host a podcast called Ask a Sub, where I answer questions all about the life of subbing. Oh, we're so, so excited, cool. too. Um, we've, like we've mentioned, we've had a lot of episodes on, like, kind of trying to be more, not a lot, we've focused on being more dominant, but mm-hmm. we're excited to focus on what it means to be a sub and like how to feel empowered in being a sub. Mm-hmm. So um, could you first define what being a sub means? Yeah, um, I think that submission, I think everyone's received notions of submission um, really have a lot to do with subs participating in certain kinks, like getting spanked or receiving pain play, um, getting tied up. But in reality, what a sub is, it's no more or less than someone who wants to participate in consensual power exchange with another person or multiple other people. So a sub is somebody who wants to give away power consensually for a prescribed period of time. And in that period of time, all kinds of kinks can be enacted, like spanking, like pain play, like having candle wax ripped on you or being human for furniture or whatever floats your boat specifically. But yeah, submission really just refers to that agreement of respectful power exchange. Are there different kinds of subs? Yeah, I mean, there's as many kinds of subs as there are subs, but we definitely have um, a number of labels in the community. Sometimes labels can be really useful because you're like, oh, that's that thing I wanted and I just didn't know what it was called. But sometimes labels can be like, oh, no, I don't fit in that box. But I think broadly, like we have... 
brats are one type of sub that I think a lot of people are familiar with and identify with. And that's a sub that likes to sort of misbehave and then receive punishment, quote unquote. And that punishment is always consensual and something that the brat is excited about. Um, But then less represented are sort of the service subs who are subs who just really get off on being very good and being rewarded for being good and they don't want to misbehave. Um, And then, you know, along that spectrum, there's all kinds of other ways of expressing submission, but those are sort of the two major categories that people tend to fall into. Okay. And then where does the category of like, you're saying you're a 24 seven sub, like are other people just subs, maybe in just lifestyle, just in sex, 24 seven, three hours a week? Like where does that play in? Yeah. So it's when you're negotiating your submission, you're saying like, I want to be a sub for this prescribed period of time. Um, For a lot of people, that is a container of time that is like for this evening, just in the bedroom. And so that might be called a bedroom only sub. And then 24 seven subs are not necessarily people who are like, I'm a sub all the time, no matter what, in every situation, but instead someone who has found a partner or partners who they feel that they want to do submission 24 seven with that person. So for me, I'm not a sub to the mailman or the barista or like any, you know, friends or family. I'm just a sub to my dom and my dom and I have the dom sub sort of language uh, within our relationship all the time. Got it. So it's not like an an act is not the right word, but it's not a performance that you're putting on. It's kind of who you feel like you are with your partner if you're a 24 yeah. seven sub. Yeah. I think it's like, so what we've negotiated is that our relationship, um, is, is always inflected by these roles because that's how we first got to know each other and how everything has been sort of built on this basis of Dom and sub. Um, so yeah, just, just for us, it's like, it's, it's sort of the, the genre of our relationship more than like something that we feel is, um, like we have to play roles with each other. It's just like, this is the tone and the language that we use. Okay. Interesting. So there's never, I'm sorry, I'm getting very specific into your relationship right now. Please. Um, is there ever a time like you would say something, but because of your specific role, you hold back or is that not how it is? Did that make sense? You know, yeah, no, totally. It does because um, I've been in vanilla relationships before where I felt, I think the main difference is in those vanilla relationships, I felt sort of that the best way of expressing um, equality between myself and my partner was for me to just say whatever at any time and have this sort of gloves off approach. Whereas I think that what's really sweet almost about my DS dynamic is that we have negotiated this sort of conscious consensual energy. So when I would never be gloves off with my partner, but I don't know that anybody should. So like, I'm, I'm always very um, conscientious of how I'm speaking to him because the way that we have these power roles set up, it just um, would violate the way that we think of each other to be disrespectful or to just be like, you know, Hey, you jerk da, 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 da. <laughs> and just like, go to that kind of darker place so like we do tend to keep things very polite with each other um that doesn't mean that I can't say whatever's on my mind I just want to say it in a way that is inflected with the politeness and gentleness that we sort of expect back and forth because like if you flip that you know and you put it on the dom for example when I have put all of this sort of capital into a relationship where I expect him to take care of me as my dominant, respect me as his submissive, for him to fly off the handle, that comes in with a much louder and scarier tone than it would just be like, oh, we're tussling around and we're arguing mm-hmm. and da, da, da. But as Dom and Sub, he has sort of a responsibility to me to keep it even keel and respectful as as I do to him. So it's sort of this agreement of, you know, we can say anything, but we have to make an effort to say it in, in a kind and respectful way. Wow. That sounds like a lot of, a lot of good work, but a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of good work. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of work that um, I think that people want to be doing, but don't always have the language for. And right. some of the privilege of being in the kink world is that you have all of this language around consent. So you're able to like name things as you go. Kind of in line with that, because I would definitely see that as a benefit. What are some other benefits of subbing, at least from your perspective? Um, You know, another unexpected hidden benefit um, is that I think that 
24-7 submission at least turns a lot of mundane tasks into foreplay um, because I like to be told what to do. So like my dom and I were just laughing because we we um, always think of ourselves as kind of bulletproof when we go into a space like Ikea, for example, where like other couples can be like melting down over decision making, mm-hmm. whereas he can just turn to me and be like, hey, go pick that thing up off of that thing. And I'm like, ooh, yeah, right away. <laughs> so like <laughs> these kinds of like spaces that can be like super mundane or even high conflict for us become this like, ooh, we're like doing something normal, but we're doing it in a sexy, weird way. So like <laughs> that's definitely like to me a major bonus because every relationship and every life has a bunch of mundane garbage in it and like now more than ever. So like having a way to like bring some spiciness into that and we're, we're really lucky to have that. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's so sweet. Absolutely. (laughs) How do you know if being a sub is within your personality would be right in your relationship? Like, how do you know if you're a sub? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of people who end up being subs um, have sort of a certain type of fantasy life. And um, what's strange is I think for a lot of us, we have these fantasies like, um, you know, being tied up, for example, or or some subs will have these sort of fantasies that are like kind of degrading or like don't fit with like normal scripts of sexuality. And I think a lot of us have trouble imagining that that could ever be okay to act out um, until we start to find spaces where other people are talking about how to do it safely and find partners who are willing to do it safely. So translating the fantasy life into reality is 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 all about learning these sort of basics of safety and trust so I think a lot of people are kinky and they just haven't had the opportunity to learn how to translate it and into real life absolutely wow yeah is there any like characteristic trait and I think this might play more into 24 7 sub that would tell you like I can't I shouldn't be in this role like I shouldn't be taking on the responsibility of a sub if I'm going to like, not like a a certain part of it? You know, um, I think, yeah, I think that our bodies are telling us so much more than we're like ready to listen to sometimes. But if you're so, so here's an anecdote from my life is that I've always had these sort of submissive fantasies, like being told what to do, like professor student kind of, you know, fantasies and things that all kind of fall under this submissive umbrella. And as I was trying to sort of put those pieces together with myself, I started enacting these things with partners, like people who were more casual or who I didn't, you know, necessarily have this sort of language yet. So I was just like, let's just try this thing. And there was no negotiation or aftercare or safe words involved but it was just like hey let's try this thing so I I did this one time with with a partner where I just said to him hey why don't you like tie me up and we'll like have sex and my wrists are bound and like we've got no skills or no one's (laughs) been to a workshop we're just like throwing it on Mm -hmm. and the moment the cuffs got into onto my wrists I like wiggled out of them and I was like no 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 get get away from me and like that's me and I'm ask a sub you know so like I don't know um for sure, like it, some of us may feel drawn to this stuff and then in actuality sense that some of the safety may be off or the partner might not be right or the time in our life might not be right or we're like pushing ourselves to do something that we think a sub would do or like a sexy sex partner would do and then it doesn't feel right and then you end up sort of questioning your validity. So ultimately, I think it's mostly just about the right sort of recipe for doing these things if they are fantasies that you have because like cut to now and like more often than not I'm finding myself myself like you know cuffed to hard points above my head with a leg spreader bar between my legs and getting flogged for like you know a solid 30 minutes and that is like worlds away from what I was doing with that other partner Mm -hmm. because I have such a different baseline of trust with the person that I'm doing it with now got it Okay. So I think, you know, for a lot of people listening, they might not be getting into a 24 seven sub situation, but if they are interested in starting to, you know, act in a more submissive role, just in different sexual experiences they're having, how do you ask a partner for that? Tell a partner that's what you're interested in and really like start doing that. Yeah. Um, I, I like to think of, um, I think a lot of people end up with these fantasies with that are like, 
to the extreme of what that fantasy might be. Like we think of like, oh, you know, oh, I got kidnapped and I got hogtied and thrown in, thrown in a, you know, somebody drunk in their car, like mm-hmm. whatever, like really elaborate version of something you might have in your head. Um, but what I sort of challenge people to do is to take the teaspoon version of that. So like take whatever it is, the thing that you're fantasizing about that you, you know, is your go-to thing that makes you come or whatever. And you just sort of scale it all the way back down to the teeny tiniest version of it. So like the teeny tiniest version of submission is saying to your partner, Hey, let's try while we're having sex this time for you to tell me to do everything that we're doing. Like I won't do anything unless you tell me to do it. And then if we don't like it, we can stop and we can say no or no, thank you or stop or I need a break. But let's just see for this one time how it feels to just like taste the little teaspoon of submission. And then like we can check in afterwards. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That's a really good like first little step. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're with um, a partner and you're, you're just starting to explain your kind of sexual preferences. Um, How do you quickly but efficiently describe like what a sub is and that you want to do it in that relationship? You know, if you're having, if this is kind of the first time you're having that talk. Yeah. I think people um, unfortunately hear the word sub and don't really know what that is. And, um, people who want to try this stuff out and are talking about it with strangers can find themselves sometimes um, like perceived as, Oh, you, you're so sex positive. You must just be into everything and you want to do everything and you're a big slut. And like, we live in this such sex negative, shamey culture where like sometimes you'll float that to somebody and they will be hearing something totally different than what you're trying to say. So I really like for people to not have to do their own labor with that and just be like, Hey, I'm really into consensual submission. Um, I'm aware of risk-aware consensual kink, RAC. That's like a, a um, acronym that we use in the community or SSC, safe, sane, and consensual. So like, this is something I'm into. Why don't you go do your own research and let's like talk in a week? <laughs> because I like I, that. Yeah. You know, there's only so much that you can be the professor for somebody. Like they need to use their own good judgment and research mm-hmm. skills to come back to you and be like, oh yes, I understand what you're saying. Well, and if somebody cares about you and wants to put in that effort, they will go mm-hmm. do the research. And I think that's also like a good vetting practice. Yeah. And come back totally. with edu- like smart questions. Mm-hmm. And by smart, I mean respectful, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So I feel like that's a really good test to see like mm-hmm. if you guys could be compatible. Totally. And it builds trust too to mm-hmm. see like, oh, you can take me seriously and go off and do something and come back with follow-up questions that I think are intelligent because ultimately all of this stuff, like talking about our desires is trust building with the other person and learning about their judgment. And when you are again, like tied with your, you know, hands above your head, getting flogged for 30 minutes, you, you want to know, I trust this person's judgment because if your lizard brain is going, Hey, they said this really dumb, insensitive thing about whatever, like that will come up in those moments, which is why I also am like, a major proponent for testing out somebody's political beliefs and their vaccine status and just going really hard on that kind of stuff because you need to know if their judgment um, can be trusted on on everything. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete sense. What if you're in a relationship with somebody and you are really interested in being a sub or in taking on a more submissive role, but they are also interested in the same and they don't necessarily feel comfortable taking on a more um dominant dominant role yeah yeah I mean two subs in a relationship always have the option of going out and finding a dom to dom them both um yeah that Mm -hmm. exists people are into that and want to do it you can hire a sex worker to dom both of you um but yeah I mean if if I would never rule out someone who's more submissive learning to switch and those partners Mm -hmm. switching off and and dominating each other but um I do think that the desire to sub never gets any quieter so if it's already sort of something that's nagging at you and and you're thinking okay I want to try this it is not going anywhere and trust me as the person who is receiving questions all the time from people who are like I've been married for 25 years and my husband has never dommed me and it's all I want in the world how do I get him to do it and it's like you're you're just you're still going to want that so it's something that you and your partner need to have an open conversation or one and one's partner and you have an open conversation about like okay, this is something we both want. How do we both get it? Right. 
I want to talk about like, you know, certain role plays that you can do, but I think this kind of leads into it. Is there more like, are there some examples of role play that you can do if, you know, one partner is going to take on that more dominant role, but isn't super confident in it that might kind of make that transition easier? Um, you know, it's funny because like the question of, of role play is kind of it, so like some people would say dom and sub play isn't role play like this is who I am. And okay. then other people would be like, we I love to do student teacher role play because that helps me get into the role of sub with like a narrative in my head. So like both are totally valid and legitimate. But um, I'll share something that a tool that my dom uses, which I know a lot of doms use, um, is that he will <laughs> I, I I make fun of him and I say he gets out the yellow legal pad, but he literally does. Like when we are trying to incorporate a new kind of um, a new skill or a new kink or like have a different sort of flow, or if we're having another person there, um, he will literally write down these, this is what's going to happen in the scene on the yellow legal pad. So if you and your partner are like, okay, you're going to take the lead doming me this time, let's get out the yellow legal pad and be like, these are the bullet points of what we both are negotiating and consenting to in advance and let's try this out because um the element of surprise does not end up actually being the most important thing when you're mm -hmm. exploring taboo sexuality sometimes it's really important to know exactly what's coming and then be excited for it rather than be like you took the lead and I had no idea what was coming at mm -hmm. me but you know like just giving giving each other this chance to check in so that that sort of confidence thing can be less of an issue because it can be really scary as a dom to just be like okay I'm just doing stuff to you now and mm -hmm. like it's it's important to have that collaborative moment if you can yeah definitely and you want to make sure like everything is comfy and you know right. like that everyone's comfortable being a dominant or a sub in like the bullet pointed mm -hmm. situations that way you're not like all right now dominate me from behind it's like well we didn't write that down <laughs> dominate yeah, the exactly. shit out of me yeah <laughs> i don't know how i don't know how and then you're sad and, yeah you know mm -hmm. nobody wants but to feel bad have, like Totally. And if you have like this little list where you, you, especially as the Dom, cause I think Doms are also really prone to like top drop, which we don't talk about enough. Like there's a lot of resources directed towards the sub and making sure that they're okay. But if the Dom is just like doing random stuff and noticing that the sub may or may not be responding to it, that can be really scary for them and end up causing these sort of, um, just, yeah, poor, sad feelings, mm -hmm. low feelings afterwards. Yeah, definitely. If you're um, interested in being a sub, but maybe haven't had a lot of practice at it, what are some ways you can like practice letting go if letting go and like kind of being submissive in a moment doesn't come naturally to you? Um, you know, I think it all starts by ourselves. So uh, just as with like how, how to make yourself come, that's how you, you tell a partner, this is how I do it when I'm by myself. Um, I think that a lot of this stuff can be learned just by spending time alone with your own body and your own imagination. So there are really great resources out there right now for like self tying, for example, where you get a length of rope and you safely tie yourself up and you put on some music and you light your candles and you know, you just get Always keep your safety shears nearby because if you've got candles lit, you need to be able you to get to yourself quickly. <laughs> you need to be quick. Yeah. I, I have a I have a close friend who was in a self tie during an earthquake down here in LA. Oh, no. <laughs> she got out. It was all fine, but yeah, always have your safety shears. At <laughs> oh my god! Um, what parts are you tying up when you're doing self tying? Like, are you hog tying? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you get where are you getting thrown? How is it? Yeah. <laughs> You're um, mainly um, your legs is like a thing that I see. So you're okay. like s s seated on the bed and you've got mm -hmm. your like massage oil in and your like s silky robe on and you're tying up your legs. Um, so just to feel that feeling of sort of containment mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe you put on a movie, maybe you like do some, write some poetry, like whatever. You just take that time to feel like these are the sensations that come up in my body when I'm held by rope or, you know, maybe you get that like sex tape that sticks to itself and just wrap yourself up and see sort of how the body responds to these different sensations and like what it tells your brain like to be sort of put in one place like with bondage. Mm -hmm. So that's really fun that because I feel like we've talked about it once kind of practicing bondage by yourself mm -hmm. but not enough because it just it does sound exciting it sounds fun and like I, I've never heard of sex tape. Mm -mm. What is that? Mm -hmm. 
It's like, um, it looks almost like duct tape. You can get it at the sex store. Um, I forget the brand that makes it, but it's like really, really shiny black and it like, okay. it, you can wrap it around and it sticks to itself. So it's like a really great wow. sort of intro to bondage as long as everyone's being conscious about like circulation and stuff. Mm-hmm. If, if, if you ever feel tingly or like, you know, like the blood isn't going where it's supposed to go, take it off. But, mm-hmm. you know, bondage can be very loose too. Bondage can also be mental. You know, there's a lot of, um, scenes where doms will use protocol bondage rather than actual bondage just by being like sit there and don't move because I told you so and (laughs) you can feel that in your body too it's like it's it's its own sensation so you know there's all kinds of ways to to play with this stuff Mm -hmm. I like that there are so many different ways to do something and that like you can really grow in your comfort with something Mm -hmm. because I do like that idea of like just being told to stay mm-hmm. there and then maybe you work your way up. Yeah. And I like the idea of starting it in kind of a non-sexual way as well. Mm-hmm. If you want to just sit and like do something that you enjoy, like journaling or watching TV and like seeing how that sensation feels for yourself and if it brings you more joy. I don't mm-hmm. know. <laughs> it's it's such a thing because like we um like I have this experience all the time where when I, you know, as a kink professional I'll look at lists of kinks and I'll say oh my god like 95% of this is so intense or so scary to me or like it's way too much and like I will look at those lists and then I'll see like the three or four things that I'm about and be like oh but that sounds fun and and even I will be like oh my god I'm not a real kinkster I'm not hardcore enough so like the thing is that you know when you're considering like this wide world of things to do the things that aren't for you are like the one or two things for somebody else or like Mm -hmm. somebody has a million things and that's so cool but like as you're starting out it's important to remember that like no one kink validates you so like for example there are a lot of subs who um for whatever reason can't do pain play and they've received this notion that subs must enjoy pain but if they have you know chronic illness or um a you know mental health relationship to pain and can't go there often they'll show up and be like well I'm a sub, but I can't do pain. And I know that that makes me not a sub. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like you are a sub if you want to exchange power and that can look like anything you want. So when we, you know, see this big intimidating world, it's just your, any given person is just chipping away at a little corner of it, at least to begin with. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because yeah, there would be some things like maybe I wouldn't want to do as a sub, but does that make me any less of it? Like not me personally, Mm -hmm. but just general question Mm -hmm. and that's a yeah like some people might not want to have pain but I'd love to be told what to do or I'd love to be like you take the charge take the charge take the dirt whatever take charge take charge (laughs) of the interaction um so I'm glad you brought that part up too in terms of actual activities I'm wondering if you can just give some examples of activities that you can do as a sub we've talked about bondage a little bit you mentioned wax in the beginning just like obviously there's endless numbers mm-hmm. of them but just some ideas for people who are just kind of getting started and are like yeah I am mm-hmm. interested in, in this but I have no fucking idea what to do totally I mean I think that there's a lot that when you are just getting started can just be psychological and um and dirty talk is a big part of that and um whenever I use the phrase phrase dirty talk I recoil because I think of the Cosmo articles of my youth that were like you know mm-hmm say this insane thing and put an ice cube in your mouth yeah. while you suck on his balls and it's just like okay it's like, well, oh, I'll try that's too many things it's too many things, too many things like at second once penis. So I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> yeah, you're holding an open flame and yeah. there's like mm-hmm. strange genitalia on you Yeah, when the moon but, is um, just right yeah. <laughs> um, it's a pagan ritual uh, mm-hmm. which is a whole nother podcast but um, yeah I think that there's a lot that you can do psychologically that like gets you into that realm without ever having to to concern yourself with the issues of physical safety that can be more daunting but of course there's emotional safety is is, is a mm-hmm. big thing so whenever you're playing with this stuff always remember to provide aftercare and just check in afterwards but um yeah I would say that a really fun place to start is um just by like narrating a hypothetical scenario with with your partner or telling your partner before you have sex or before you're you know in the mood of like this is this is my fantasy and like can you like tell it back to me when we're like in the moment or um another thing that some subs not all subs but some subs will like to play with is um degradation play um where you're kind of told like oh you know you're a little you know you're a dirty little slut etc um and everyone has words that work for them or don't work for them but um 
as you're starting to play with it, the other really great thing to think about is tone. Um, And so this is like, it's free. You can do it with no workshops or no training, but like tell your partner, for example, I want to be called a dirty little slut, but I want you to do it in a very gentle and warm tone as I'm getting used to it. And, or I want to hear it in a super mean tone, or I just want to hear neutral things in a mean tone, like get on the bed, you know, in a mean, (laughs) stern way. So like, there's these kinds of things like, you know, just narrating what's going on and what tone is being used that can be negotiated down to these tiny minutia and planned in advance with or without your yellow legal pad. (laughs) And then, you know, you both know what's coming. Thank you for explaining that. And Mm -hmm. I feel like at least in my head, I've associated subbing with more of that like degradation play. Mm -hmm. But then Mm -hmm. being on TikTok, I also saw a lot of videos about like praise, like having a praise kink. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, as, uh, an American living with a praise kink, I, <laughs> um, yeah, no praise kink is, it's great. It's, it's when you want to be praised. So like that's mm-hmm. sort of in that service sub department where you want to do something right and be called a good girl. So like, mm-hmm. it's, it's about, you know, whether you've just done something right, like out in the world or you've served dinner or whatever, and you're being told you're good, good girl, good boy, good sub, all kinds of genders, um, enjoy praise um but yeah uh definitely in a sexual context to be praised or told you're doing well um not only is just it's very sweet and it's great but like when all of us have been raised with this really sex negative culture that also expects all of us to arrive to sex super experienced and cool and know exactly what's going on and be like really in charge and on top of it but like not too experienced because then that's that's bad but like so we never know how to thread the needle and I think a lot of us are always questioning like am I doing this right is it cool is it good so for me like maybe the main benefit of submission has been to always know that I'm doing it right because my dom would tell me otherwise or tell me to do something differently so like when I come into a scene and I'm just doing as I'm told and then being told I'm doing a good job it just creates this really safe sort of cocoon for me aside from all of the like crazy wild theatrics and the, <laughs> you know the ice cubes in my mouth like <laughs> just being told that I'm good is is really special mm-hmm. yeah yeah that does sound really nice because you're you're right the only types of subs I've I've pictured in my head is more of a stern like I'm getting in trouble mm-hmm. sub. And so sometimes I feel like you want, you want to be a sub, but told I'm pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. like that too. We all want to hear we're pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me personally too, like I, like over the past few months, what I've wanted in Dirty Talk has really changed, which I didn't really expect because I did like a little bit more degrading like last year, but right now I'm like a lot more overwhelmed in my Mm -hmm. everyday life. I'm just more sensitive. And so like I had to ask my partner, I'm like, actually, I don't think I want that right now. Maybe someday again, but right now I want more like praise and like nicer words. Mm -hmm. And obviously he was like, okay, great. Um, (laughs) Obviously he said no and (laughs) And we're done. So (laughs) moving on. Um, But yeah, I think that has really shifted for me personally Mm -hmm. does that that's such a brave thing to know about yourself to be able to be like the world is shit or I'm going through such (laughs) and such a thing so like I should not expect myself to show up to sex being Mm -hmm. the same person that I was yesterday or an hour ago or whenever just like being able to have that active communication is so important Mm -hmm. thank you I am really brave I am really (laughs) brave I am really brave and very strong Mm -hmm. and very good (laughs) yes and very good just keep praising me (laughs) okay Have, uh, has your relationship dynamic changed at all over the course of however long, like your sub role or his dom role? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, initially I think we were very high protocol with each other and that sort of image that you have of, of dom and sub of like, you know, I would come in the door and I would take off all my clothes and I would walk on all fours and I, you know, we would have like a very sort of like, you know, again, high protocol, very formal way of relating to each other. And, you know, as any um, small, adorable raccoon of a human is going to do, I warmed my way into his heart and (laughs) things have gotten more and more like warm and cozy as needed. And then we can always switch tone into that high protocol space um, in a scene. But um, yeah, there's things now that that are have become just by nature of, of living together and we are married now. So like there's just levels of life that come at you and, and things things change, of course, and Um, one sort of interesting thing to that end is like being married and combining finances, like 
has for me has sort of challenged my submissive role because that's an area where I feel like I really know what I'm doing. So Mm -hmm. to be more competent and more like I'm the one taking charge of this thing, it's been um, really great to use our DS communication skills for me to be like, Hey, I want to take charge of this thing. But sometimes when I do, I feel like not subby. So can you validate me that I'm still good and, and small and cute, even if I'm like, balancing the checkbook I don't even know how to do that but you know whatever the digital equivalent but (laughs) Mm. um yeah so like that there's all kinds of things that always grow and change and it's so important like for me and and anybody to just remember that like you don't become unsexy with higher levels of intimacy and you don't become not a sub if you're like doing things slightly differently so like although the things change, like your, your sexual identity still gets to be whatever you make it like Mm -hmm. in the moment. Yeah. I love that. And kind of with that, I feel like you mentioned brat play and how you're a sub, but you're kind of like bossy (laughs) and naughty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how do those two go hand in hand where you're still a sub, but you're also back talking? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what brats, brats love that. Um, and, and, um, mainly I think the, the main tension in bratting is that sometimes not always, never always, but sometimes brats are people who like impact play or they like to be spanked, for example. So the classic, classic bratting scenario is I'm back talking, so I'm going to get a spanking. So the spanking is what you want and you're back talking in order to get it because the spanking is punishment. So like okay. there's there's an, a, an understanding between the brat and the dom that like when the brat pushes, they are asking for something that they want um, and that's just how they're getting it. Um, but I think also a lot of subs only are familiar with that dynamic when they're coming in. They're like, oh, if I want to get spanked, spanking and pain is a punishment so I need to act out in order to get it so for me like I'm I'm not a brat as it turns out but when I first came into submission I was like I want to get spanked so I got to act out and I would do that with my partners and I would literally end up with like a stomach ache afterwards because I'm like oh no are they mad at me I think we just got in a fight you know? <laughs> so like that for me didn't end up being part of my sexuality and it, a lot of subs take some time to be like whether bratting is for them just because bratting is sort of like the first stop on the way in and some people are like yes I am a brat I am a chaos monster and, I love <laughs> havoc. and those people I fucking love them and they go deeper and deeper into the chaos rabbit hole but then some of us are like wait hold on that's just the only version of subbing I knew about so I want to go mm. try it a different way and just say like pain is a reward like I'm getting praised and being told I'm a good girl while I'm getting spanked that's like a totally different paradigm that totally suits some people but not others got it okay so that's a little bit different of like explanation that I was expecting I guess I don't know but I like it it's fun (laughs) yeah yeah so yeah, brat, I mean, bratting, it's it's a whole world. It's just not, it's not, I have friends who are brats. I'm not a brat. So like, I always have to like, sort of be like, hey, can you explain to me? Like, so when you do this, you you, you don't, you don't cry a little bit afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> There's like no tears. Yeah. Because yeah, do you get a little scared? <laughs> <laughs> so you're basically saying that the difference is brats enjoy punishment, not mm-hmm. the reward. And like your type of sub enjoys the reward of behaving. In, yeah, in very broad terms, but brats, Mm -hmm. you know, brats, yeah, really like to have the sort of push pull of being put in their place. That's like what Mm -hmm. the back talk is all about. And I think that brats really like to see like a show of force out of their partners of like putting them in their place. And that in its own way can be a love language of care. Like you're seeing me be a little shit and you care enough to spank me about it. So that means that our dynamic is in play and we're like speaking to each other in each other's language. So yeah, bratting, bratting just, it's sort of, it's just a different means to the same end of being seen and getting the sensation play that you might be after. Got it. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> Do you have it? So interesting. Yeah. <laughs> what, what other like main areas of subplay do you like to touch on when like educating or talking about subplay? Is there anything like we're not bringing up when it comes to like general knowledge you should know? Um, you know, another 
department that is not explicitly submission, but I think a lot of people have questions about, and if it's okay to talk about, feel free to stop me and we'll go back, but um, is consensual um, non-consent, which is a fantasy that a lot of people have, and almost everyone thinks they're the only one, but um, it's super common, and using sort of the safe tools of BDSM to enact it, whether or not there's kink involved, is... um, ultimately, I think, very emotionally safe and smart. Um, So yeah, that's something that I like to try to normalize and talk about as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, that can really be a hard one for people to bring up and then Mm -hmm. find people that are willing to talk about it Mm -hmm. and be like, that's normal too. And here's just the safe way to do it and like finding the right people to do it with. Makes sense. Totally. Yeah, because it's so much more about being desired than it is about like something forcible happen because it's like you want to be like oh somebody like really really wants me and that's sort of I think what's more at the core of it for mm-hmm. people so like again I like to sort of when people come to me with consensual non-consent I like to say like okay do the teaspoon version of it like take it down really really small and just like try like a tiny flavor of something within that fantasy and then mm-hmm. and then take the teaspoon and then check in and be like, how did that feel? How did that feel for you? How did it feel for me? And do we want to take it up to a tablespoon or do we want to stay where we are? And like, Mm -hmm. that's another one of those things. It's not explicitly power exchange, but it's so next door that like, I think that it deserves sort of like the same level of consideration. What would that teaspoon be? Like just an example. Yeah. For, for, so for me, I think um, exploring the word no can be very, um, exciting and thrilling um because it it is very very taboo and loaded um and that's why uh safe words are a thing um so that if you do want to explore with the word no you can but also because safe words um I think in pop culture we have this understanding of safe words like you say something really silly and it sort of cuts the mood mm-hmm. like you're like octopus and everyone's like oh. <laughs> but like in my experience you know as a sub who's done this sort of like harder impact or or a you know sort of larger scale kinks times when I've needed to use my safe word have never occurred to me to be a time when I want everyone to be laughing because I said something really silly. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, I, I really prefer like the neutral um, color system of red mm-hmm. and yellow because those words come with a plan attached that you've negotiated and, and they're neutral. So like when you hear the word yellow and you know that you're supposed to just like take it slow and check in, that feels totally different than like, no, which, which, you know, should absolutely still be a safe word if you wanted to, but that you've heard your whole life in negative connotations. You're scared to say it. You're scared to hear it. Mm -hmm. Yellow doesn't mean anything other than what you decide it means. So like, Mm -hmm. if you set up those safe words, you can play with like words like no in that sort of consensual non-consent thing or play with like a little bit of body language. And that's as far as it goes for a lot of people. And that feels like plenty because it's so, internal um all the things that are going on with that what do you mean by body language um like so for me it's definitely a kink that I have and there are times where I'll kind of like be like twisting away or like be want to be sort of like dragged closer like pull away and be dragged closer and like that kind of thing if I said in advance to my dom I'm like I want to sort of wiggle away and you pull me back that's that's Mm -hmm. sort of like an example, which again, it's like, yes, it sort of has that one, the non-consent narrative to it. But then at the same time, it's like, well, we both know I'm wiggling away on purpose and I just want to feel him pull me back. And it just Mm -hmm. is the sensation of being pulled back. So. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. That's, that would, that would kind of be fun. I don't know. (laughs) It could be fun. (laughs) I'm just here to incept ideas that will come to fruition in six months. (laughs) Yeah. Like one that I was kind of thinking is like, um, role play, it's, it's layered. I've been thinking. <laughs> like, let's say, I have a scenario for you. Yeah. Like, let's say you're at the gym with like your partner or someone and you pretend to not know each other, mm-hmm. but they come by and like touch you inappropriately. Mm. I mean, that'd be hard because other people might see that and like, ah. <laughs> but, but like to you, like, like a stranger's mm-hmm. touching you and you weren't supposed to, but like you really actually wanted it. To. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking. It can just be a fantasy too. It can, like, it can, it can be, also fun. be something you don't I'm not, do. No, I wasn't thinking <laughs> it that way. <laughs> you don't have to feel yeah. you don't have to think about all of the all things the that fucking could things. happen yeah exactly but I like the or body in language. a bar uh-huh mm-hmm. yeah it yeah. touch the small of your back and nobody notices because it's mm-hmm. too crowded and mm-hmm. yeah yeah I'm with you don't worry <laughs> <laughs> I like the the idea of taking little teaspoons or tablespoons of these mm-hmm. really big ideas and just finding a way to play with it safely mm-hmm. for yourself and like you said knowing that 
people do have these more taboo fantasies or kinks or desires and knowing how to educate yourself on that and your partner and find somewhere to like learn about it is important. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, all the best science that we have suggests that most people have some kind of kink because the word kink just means different than the norm. And what is the sexually received norm? It's like, we, we, there's not really anything we can agree upon other than like a cishet husband and wife having missionary sex for procreation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, yeah, (laughs) anything other than that is kinky. So I think everyone can benefit from these kinds of tools and ways of talking about things. Yeah. Absolutely. That's like the perfect definition of kink. Mm -hmm. It's like, just figure out what's not that (laughs) for you. And if people are doing only that, like that's very kinky in and of itself. Like if you're only (laughs) doing it in missionary to procreate, like, You've got a weird thing going on, and I respect it. <laughs> and I respect it. I love that. Live um, on, my friend. I have a little bit of a specific question, but what are like your favorite kinds of handcuffs and bed restraints? Oh yeah, well, um, for me, I think that the safest and most accessible is a leather, whether it's leather or vegan leather cuff, like a wide leather cuff mm. that goes on your wrists and your ankles if needed, and that those can clip um, into. Uh, onto each other, onto a hard point, um, onto a a spreader bar. Um, but those are great because they, the broadness of them makes them less likely to be digging in and causing those kinds of circulation Mm -hmm. problems that we talked about before. Like, you know, a rope is going to be like a much higher level of like, you need to know what you're doing and you need to know your body and be really familiar, but the leather cuffs in general, you can kind of just slap them on and start playing around. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I really like those. And I like sort of the sensation too of the, of the leather on my skin and the sound of like the metal clinking together. And that's all (laughs) stuff that really does something for me. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's also that stuff like that bondage tape and all kinds of other ways to do restraints. And, Mm -hmm. and it also bears mentioning that we're very lucky to be alive in a time where leather gear is not always black and silver and you can get like cute pink ones Mm -hmm. or um blue ones or just any other types of and silicone it doesn't have to be leather so like finding the 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 material and the color that makes you feel affirmed and like not like you're being put into a kinky box that you don't want to be in is is weirdly important it's not something you'd expect but if you look down and you see these cute leather cuffs that are pink you know then you might feel a little more included in like your own fantasy which is what you're ultimately getting that stuff for yeah that's actually really nice I was thinking oh yeah because fashion <laughs> like, you know you yeah, can wear it out. fashion forward <laughs> you can wear it out if you want I don't know dual purpose but that makes sense too if like if if black leather and like silver feel maybe like dungeony to you, you're a gold girl. <laughs> yeah. What mm-hmm. if you're a gold girl? What if I look better? What in about gold? your undertones? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I'm sorry. Yeah. If I want to be told I'm pretty, I want to mean it. I want to. I want to be yeah. there and do it. Yeah. Need the accessories. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but like colors feel so fun and flirty, and if mm-hmm. leather, like black leather, feels more serious and a different type of fantasy, that makes total sense. Mm-hmm. And Cass brought up this uh, silicone handcuffs a while ago. Mm-hmm. And I really like that option too, because I've only ever tried the like typical police grade. Yeah, police grade. <laughs> uh, those things. Yeah, no, those are those are very dangerous actually, and it's very strange that they, and especially the, the little furry ones too. Like those end up being a lot of people's like first introduction of like, oh, the fuzzy handcuffs, but yeah. the, like those are the way that they restrict your movement and how close your wrists are together. Like it's, it's for criminals. It's not. For, you know. and, and if that's your fantasy, that's, that's great. And and I'm sure that there's ways to do it safely, but unfortunately everyone's first exposure to bondage is those, and those are not um, particularly safe for your circulation or your wrists or your skin or any, any of the above. That's good to know because yeah. I just thought I wasn't comfortable in them, you know? Yeah. And I was like, ah, I no can't do is. handcuffs. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so maybe I just need to find the right handcuff for me or the right mm-hmm. bondage type. But also, it, um, definitely before we close out, I would love to talk about aftercare for a second. If yes. Okay. Let's do that. Mm-hmm. That's perfect. Nice. Okay. So, um, yeah, aftercare is a practice from BDSM that I think has major crossover potential. Like it needs to be in everyone's sexual practice. So um, in BDSM, We have this agreement that, um, you know, every safe scene, which is just the sort of negotiated container that all the kinks are happening in, after a scene, it will conclude in aftercare, which is this time for um, both partners or all partners, anyone who's there to co-regulate each other's nervous systems and to take a moment to say like, hey, this like really exciting, spicy stuff just went down. So let's like lie side by side and um, 
like listen to calming music or like watch um like for me one of my faves for aftercare is to find these like loop videos of aquariums on youtube and <laughs> i just, love like, that <laughs> lie there with my dom and look at the fish and comment on what the fish are doing and have a big glass of water so um we have this practice in bdsm because you know it's like oh we're playing with such big you know themes and feelings but I think that any sex is playing with big themes and feelings and discounting it to the point like oh that was just like a 15 minute quickie before work we don't need to like co-regulate you do I think that even aftercare can be really small aftercare can be a teaspoon but it's really important um for people to just have the ability to rely on the idea that sex always concludes the same way and that's with a check-in and BDSM doesn't always include sex sometimes you're just performing kinks without having sex but either way um having that moment to come back together and check in is um is really important because um postcoital dysphoria is a thing which is like just a very fancy term for feeling kind of blue or sad after sex or mm-hmm. having a cry or feeling like I'm I'm somebody who I I cry like 9 times out of 10 after <laughs> I have an orgasm because it's just like it's intense for me so like having that container of aftercare to be like oh I'm feeling a little bit sensitive and I want to cuddle and watch an aquarium is a really important great thing to rely on so like if that can be the one thing from like the hardcore whips and chains world Mm -hmm. of BDSM that everybody needs it's the cuddling and the aquarium watching afterwards yeah thank you for saying that Mm -hmm. I will say I cry a lot of the time after sex and I never really understood it I just knew that like I felt like a lot of emotions and like things would just come Mm -hmm. up and then I'd start thinking about something else so I'm really glad that you just normalized that because honestly in high school some guy randomly said like oh are you a crier during sex and I was like no oh god but I am but I am yeah Yeah. honestly no that's terrible and like that totally was a was a great moment for like me too I feel Mm -hmm. like I get the blues Mm -hmm. sometimes Mm -hmm. but it's I'm not sad and I don't want to like talk about it I just maybe I've never had the right aftercare for sex Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. like that moment of uh you know you said what is regulating yeah yeah yeah. and it's just this non-verbal agreed upon moment so you don't have to be like I'm feeling sad come here and fix it you're just Mm -hmm. like oh it's aftercare time let's see what the fish are doing or (laughs) whatever your version of aftercare is yeah yeah, I like mm-hmm. a cookie and a show would be nice. A for cookie me. and a show cookie that feels like show. my kind of aftercare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just for most things. Because even though you know, our the whole point of our podcast is normalizing sex. At the same time, sex is a big deal. Yeah, and like, yeah. no matter how somebody is touching you or inside of you, like they are touching you and inside of you. Yeah, and that's a big deal. Yeah, so I it's like a that big you. Deal. I like that you said like any type of sex mm-hmm. should deserve like this aftercare in some mm-hmm. like teaspoon or full cup helping way of Mm -hmm. you know just coming back to like a center (laughs) because it would be so cool if we lived in a culture where sex was just like a bodily function that just occurred without thinking about it but we've been raised with so much sex negativity that even a 15 minute quickie before work you're like oh I did something dirty and oh I don't know and did it what how did I look did I look weird how did I look to you you know and it's just like with that cocktail of sex negativity and body shame, like it's, it's very high stakes. You're cooking with gas every time. So like having just a scalable um, agreement to be like, let's check in. Like, I think that's good for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I cannot agree Uh, more. That was so beautiful. I love, (laughs) I love hearing different people's um, recipes for aftercare too. I feel Mm -hmm. like we've, we've gotten that, you know, a lot of people discuss Mm -hmm. it, but I just like hearing the differences of like, how you could go about it and the Mm -hmm. ways it can present itself. And with this one talking about the blues that can definitely come up and be totally normal. So yeah, yeah, thank you for wrapping up with that too. Yeah. Where can our listeners continue connecting with you after this episode? Uh, They can follow me on Instagram at ask a sub. Um, They can come listen to my podcast also called ask a sub. We're between seasons right now. So if you like it, leave us a review, let us know. Um, And then I write long form advice. I respond to DMS and I host a very large thriving discord community through my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash ask a sub where you can find out all about that. I was trying to think of a dumb thing to say, oh, but I dumb dumb. Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> But it also works for damn. Mm-hmm. A dumb Can't thing. Think of a dumb thing. Dumb thing. I would dom's be a damsel very... in distress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a damsel. Um, I would not be a good dom at all. Well, maybe yeah. I would. I mean, 
you know, going back to our Dom episodes, I think I learned how to be my own type of Dom. Mm -hmm. Have I mastered it? No. (laughs) No. But I also, in this episode, I think we also learned a power in being a sub Mm -hmm. as well. Exactly. The huge thing is the consensual exchange of power. Because then in that... Big words. Thank you. you. (laughs) Because in that instance, like, it's not like one person is powerless. Mm -mm. Which is just such a thing, a good thing to... Well, if you were choosing to give somebody power, you are actually the one in power. More powerful? Sorcerer? Oh. A wizard? A wizard? A wizard? Are you a wizard? (laughs) Are you a wizard? I don't know. Come to make me come. (laughs) Come to make me. Absolutely. Absolutely. We should play Dungeons and Dragons. I won't be there. Thank you, Lena, for being on the podcast today. I would love to do this again and talk about like more about being a twenty four hour mm-hmm. seven day weeks up. Absolutely. Very interesting. And thank you to our listeners for being here. Are you Working to on my tone. Dommy. I'm having a Dom tone. Mm. Yeah. Saying nice things in a dominant way. That's also how you can work with different types of role play that's what lena said okay then i won't be asking go on over to apple Podcasts, rate review and subscribe to mm-hmm. honey do me that's a straight up order mm-hmm. go ahead and use handcuffs as the emoji are there handcuffs emojis no no there's chains use the chains yeah, use the chains <laughs> use bitch. them mm-hmm. filthy little bitch and then yeah. share this with somebody mm-hmm and make them listen. <laughs> make them. Consensually. Consensually give the power to them to listen. Yeah. Or, well, you know. Yeah. Wow. We'll see you next we week. We will <laughs> see you next week. Bye. Goodbye.